Hey everyone, a uh, bit of an unofficial face reveal. Uh, sorry that the video footage isn't too great. Um, but today I had something really special for you. Um, I spoke to um, Zev, aka Seekers of Unity, um, who has an amazing YouTube channel, which I think you should all check out. Uh, there'll be links in the description where you can uh, learn about um, mysticism, mythology, and religion. Um, and he has a lot of uh, the same interests as me. And so I thought it would be uh, um, a good idea if we could have a conversation and get a dialogue going um, about uh, the things we're interested in, psychology, religion, mysticism, and the sort of intersection between all of those different things. Um, like I said, his channel is really great. I really recommend you check it out. Um, but anyways, thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoy. Great. So, yeah. So what I wanted to ask um, was, for you, what what does mysticism mean? Uh, for, some, for, for, for somebody who uh, doesn't understand or who's never really encountered the term mysticism, uh, how would you explain it to them? Uh, it's a really, it's a really good question. And uh, it's not a simple question to answer. It's not an easy question to answer. Mm. Because try, firstly, trying to define anything at all uh, is tricky business. Um, even like defining a word like definition is, mm -hmm. is, a, is, a, is, 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 is very tough, um, which goes to the root of the issue. But uh, the, the issue with, with mysticism is that the, the datum that you're trying to fit a definition onto is so broad and so vast and so rich. Mm -hmm. um, and the job of the definition is essentially to find the key commonalities that speaks true across all of that data uh, without being too narrow to exclude data and without being too wide to include data that's not mysticism. Um, that's, that's one problem. Um, another problem is that sometimes our preconceived notions of what should be considered the datum of mysticism then affects the definition. So very often these, these definitions work backwards because right, mm. you assume what's mysticism and then you create the pull of mystical texts and thinkers and ideas and then you like try and redraw. So right. the whole game of definition is kind of a funny one. Uh, in the actual the actual history of sort of the scholarship of mysticism, there have been many attempts to define mysticism. Um, initially, a lot of that scholarship that was done was done by Christians. So the definitions by definition were very Christocentric mm. um, and they placed a high premium on uh, Christian mysticism, Western mysticism, and only following that um, was really room given to, to Eastern mysticism. Um, and obviously that's been corrected now because the field has more, is, is less biased towards, towards subjective and individualistic readings. And the, the definitions that have emerged are predominantly things like, the, there's, there's, a really good, there's a really good definition that comes from Evelyn Underhill. She says, mysticism mm -hmm. is the art of union. Mm. Um, and typically it's understood as that, as, as the, the attempt, the, the framework, the methodologies, the theories around uniting with the ultimate with reality typically in many traditions that's conceived as as god as the deity uh, in other traditions there is no god in mysticism um so mm -hmm. sometimes it's just let it, it's better left with the real with reality with sort of a capital r right um but i think I, at, and within that there's, there's a bit of debate whether it's about encountering the the deity or the real experiencing the the reality or uniting with it um, I, in my own humble definition, I, I push for a more of a unitive than just experiential. Mm -hmm. I think I think we can differentiate between religious experience and mystical experience, mm -hmm. um, where one is can be more of an encounter and the other one is more of a unitive encounter, unitive experience. Um, and I think I think the, the for me the definition that I've come up with that makes the most sense is mysticism is unity in experience, theory, and practice, which means that there's a real experience where the individual has and can and we know this for a fact historically and contemporaneously can experience the oneness of being the unity of the all the, the the dissolution of the self and the and the other of the object and subject however it's called the the death of the ego however you want to call it mm -hmm. that experience is a unit of experience i believe fundamentally uh, and then we build theories um surrounding that theologies metaphysics philosophies theologies um mythologies i'm sorry if i'm repeating myself to try mm -hmm. and make sense of that experience and then the practices that emerge from that are both ethical practices how one goes about living in accordance with that i think that's a mystical way of life and the practices which try and make one more susceptible to to be to either induce those experiences or to live in accordance 
with the dictates of that experience. So unity in experience theory practice is, is the definition that I'm rolling with now, but it's something which is always in my head. And literally it's a question which I ask myself, like when I'm constantly reading, it's always like I'm coming back to my definition and trying to see, is my am, I, am I imposing my definition on what I'm trying to see or, or, or am I open to, to changing it? And, and I hope that, you know, as someone who's trying to do mm-hmm. good um, scholarship as objective as I can, um, I, it's, it's open to change. And if you ask me that in, in a week from now or in a month from now or a year from now, I may have quite a different definition, but um, that's what it is for now. And, uh, and mm-hmm. that's why I called my, my channel the, the Seekers of Unity, because I think that's what the mystics are about. They're seeking after unity. Um, mm-hmm. Lawrence, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you up well, with one quote on that. Um, Lawrence Kushner, a contemporary Jewish teacher of mysticism, he says that the mystic is the one who senses that beneath the, the rupture and the discord, and the discontinuity and, and multiplicity that we experience in reality lies a, a deeper unity and peace and harmony and oneness. And I think that's, I think that's really a beautiful definition of, of the mystic. And yeah. Mysticism. It, yeah. It really sounds, it's, it's, it's like a very all encompassing idea. It's, and I, like, I really like the idea of it's the art, the art of union. Mm. Um, it's almost like a, a, us being in union with the, with the universe um so to speak not to get too <laughs> not to sound like a hippie or anything but you know no i mean there's a lot of there's definitely a lot of overlap between hippieism and, and mysticism so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're entitled you're entitled to sound like a hippie <laughs> yeah um so another more specific thing i wanted to talk to you about was um uh, jewish mysticism and kabbalah and the reason i the re- uh, the reason again um, we spoke about this before but um has to do with um a chapter in eric neumann's book the origins and history of consciousness which i have here um in which he discusses uh, a little bit briefly the kabbalah and um its sort of psychological significance um if there was through um uh, several symbols that appear in this system um and i was wondering if if you could explain um so Generally speaking, I, I, I'm a little bit familiar with Kabbalah, but uh, I feel like I could always enrich my understanding of it and gain, gain other perspectives. Um, and so how I understand it, and you can correct me if I, if I uh, don't add enough detail or if I'm mistaken, um, but it has several components. Um, the, the, I guess the overarching component is the Ein Sof, um, w- which I understand is sort of like uh, the, the true nature of the divine. Um, which is kind of unmanifested. It's un, in, 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 imperceptible to sort of human senses. Um, and then that sort of that, and so the universe kind of manifests uh, through the sephirot, um, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, sephirot, um, which, is, which is how the universe becomes perceptible to man's uh, sort of uh, ability to perceive the world. Um, and so it goes from a state of unmanifest potential to a state of reality and sort of the physical universe um is that is that uh, correct or yeah that's a pretty that's a pretty fair description um i think i think that the the relationship between the sefirot and insof um operates on, on many different levels and realities and and the the kabbalists employ this construct or, or metaphor or system of the sefirot to mm-hmm. to explain and answer different questions and i think uh, that that's one instance where the sefirot are used, and I think the way you described it is is fairly accurate. Yeah. Yeah, and and what Eric Neumann talk, says about these um, is that this this sort of relationship between the Ein Sof and the Sephirot um, are very are in some sense a, de- a derivation of psycho- psychological processes. Um, so you can kind of think of the Ein Sof as the sort of plane of unconsciousness. And then Sephirot as sort of the the process by which consciousness, or rather the manifestation of consciousness from the unconscious, um, and that I think makes a lot of sense um, because you can you can kind of think of the unconscious as unmanifested potential, um, where you know you have ideas swimming in your unconscious. Well, I, I can give you a more concrete example. Like if you ima- if you have like a really great idea, for example, one day, but then the next day you you forget what that idea was. Well, that, I, that idea is never gone. It's, it's kind of in your brain, just swimming around. It just needs to be re-manifested or re-brought back into consciousness. Um, and so that's why that connection between the Ein Sof as being sort of the unconscious, that, that realm of potential, and the Sephirot as being sort of the manifestation of that potential um, makes a lot of sense. And that's why he, he argues that it's kind of derived from psychology. Um, and sort of, sort of uh, his, his thesis, I guess, in the book is that 
a lot of the natural psychological processes that we experience um, that are you know uni quite universal, although not always universal, um, are reflected in mythology and are reflected in mysticism. And the symbols we see in mythology and mysticism are um, are, re are inadvertently descriptions of human psychology. But it's not just that, right? Because it's also it's also attempt to describe the greater universe. So it's almost right. like we use our psychology to describe something which is sort of beyond our psychology, which is beyond yeah. the scope of the of a normal human life. Yeah. So so this is it's it's a very good question, and it's a very good topic that you're that you're touching on here. Um, the this this obfuscation, this this melt this melding and blurring between the exploration of the human psyche. Um, and also the physiognomy of the human, the physical makeup, um, and the the ontological or, or cosmological makeup of reality, mm -hmm. is intentionally blurred in Kabbalistic thought. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you find this in mysticism in general. I mean, going, turning back to the definition that we just gave in mysticism, that mysticism is inherently about union and oneness. So therefore, the mystics throughout throughout traditions and cultures don't see a fundamental distinction between the individual anthropos, the microcosm, and the world at large, the macrocosm. They see them mm. as reflections of one another, as, as mirror mm. images. Um, and the Kabbalists, being good mystics, do exactly the same, where they, they don't see a, a fundamental rupture or discontinuity between what's out there, the world structure, and the internal world. They see them really as mirror images of one another, micro, microcosm, macrocosm, as above, so below. These are basic principles that run through Kabbalistic thought. And um, in addition to that, the Kabbalists are pulling from in mystics in, 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 in more traditional religious settings have a corpus of sacred texts, which they're drawing from and interpreting mystically. Mm -hmm. um, in, it, actually, in, in, in Western terminology, the, the term mysticism, and this has been pointed out by French scholar uh, Michel Dussertou, begins actually as a form of interpreting the Bible. Mystical theology is the first use of the word mysticism. Mm. Borrowing earlier from the mystikoi of the Greeks, uh, from the Greco-Roman religions, which means to close one's eyes and mouth. But when mysticism is first used, it's used as a form of, interpret of interpreting the Bible. Um, and this applies for the Jewish mystics as well. The Jewish, mystic the Jewish mystics and Jewish sages in general have four levels of interpreting the biblical text. Pshat, Remez, Jerusha, and Soed, which is the simple, straightforward meaning the, the hints, um, the, the, the allegorical or the, the moral, and so it finally is the secret, namely the Kabbalistic, the mystical. Um, and so therefore the Kabbalists turn back to the biblical text and particularly to Genesis is, one of, is a very rich and fruitful text of the Kabbalists. Um, and the text in Genesis by the creation of Adam says, God says, let us create man in our image. Nasta Adam Betzalemenu is the Hebrew. Mm. And the Kabbalists, see something incredible here, which is not just that the human physically, psychologically, spiritually is a reflection and a mirror to the macrocosm to the world, but they also see the human as a mirror to the divine. And that by peering and by exploring the human, we can understand the divine and vice versa, by exploring the divine, we can understand the human. Um, because fundamentally they're created in the image of one another and at a deeper level, they're they're also one because the mystics have to believe in inherent oneness and they, they don't believe that there's a that there's a fundamental distinction and duality between the human and the divine they believe that fundamentally there's a unity of duality and the divine which we can probably get into mm -hmm. later um, and based on that principle from genesis and that reading of genesis and based on a principle that's being read from a verse in ecclesiastes if i'm not mistaken where the where the text says mipsari uh, that from my own flesh uh, i will perceive divinity, um, that the Kabbalists believe that by analyzing the structure of the psyche and by analyzing the structure of the body as well, they could understand the divine structure. Um, and the way the spherot, which you mentioned, which, which is, if not the core theme or, or definitely top five core topics in, in Kabbalah, the spherot are seen to, to map the divine manifestation, as you put it well, and they're also seen to map the human psyche, the process from Keter all the way down to Malchut, from the first to the tenth, is seen as the process of, of creation, of relation, of expression, of emanation, all the processes that humans go through, according to the Kabbalists, go through these stages. That's how they conceptualize it. And the human body, likewise, those spheroids are placed along the body, much like the, the chakras are placed at different points of the body. Um, 
So this, 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 there's this very, there's this lateralization of thinking, which is, a, which is what I like to call it. There's this lateral logic where we, there's an association and identity where human mind, human body, uh, divine, um, the world at large are all parallel. And if we can find those points of parallel, if we can, if we can sort of stick those needles through at the, at the right point that pierce them, all of those characters, we can understand how they're all one map that's superimposed one on top of the other. And that's, I think that's how the Kabbalists see and conceptualize and map reality. Yeah, that's uh, that's really fa that's a really fascinating explanation um, because it, it touches on a lot of what I discuss on uh, what I discuss on the channel. Because um, uh, uh, one of the things I'm interested in is sort of the the origins of human knowledge and how we we sort of how did we discover things? Because it's not it's it's an interesting question. Because how do we understand anything? Um, and so, and it's like what you said, it's like we, uh, so um, from early mythology, uh, from what I've, what I've read about a lot of early mythologies, they use the body as sort of the scheme to understand uh, the world. They sort of see, for example, like they think of like, for example, metaphors like the heart of the world. Um, you know, they extend by metaphor something that's familiar, the body itself, into something which is more universal. universal. Um, and so that's what I really liked uh, when you said that sort of the, that the psyche is a mirror reflection of the external universe, as well as the fact that, um, or the idea that um, mankind is a reflection of the deity. Um, because I, I when I, you know, these, it, it, I, there's something I think is really significant about humans and about human nature, which I, th which I think is just so beautiful and profound, how we can, how we can sort of um, love and love each other and forgive each other, which I think is just, so much you know it's it's it is kind of divine in a sense and not merely derived from the natural it does seem to, to me to be of a sort of higher higher origin um so i think so i think uh, what you said was really really interesting and it really resonated with me um another thing i wanted to ask you about was the symbol of um in genesis um of adam cadman which is a concept that i can't i i've seen the different uh this sort of explanations of it but the one Neumann gives, if I can just pull up the text, the one, the definition that Neumann, the way Neumann explains it is that um, in some sense, um, so uh, um, Adam, so I, I, I grew up as a Roman Catholic. So how I understood the um, Genesis creation story was that Adam, God first creates Adam. And then from Adam, he, uh, from Adam's rib, he creates Eve. And um, one of the things Neumann points out is that this separation of uh, sort of bringing a, a producing a woman out of a man is is also very is also a potent psychological symbol because it represents the sort of uh, emergence of man from the womb of the unconscious, uh, the womb of the unconscious being associated with the with the maternal with the feminine, you know, it's the place of origin, and then mankind as being sort of the symbol of consciousness emerges from that situation. Um, and he also says that separation um, is uh, closely associated with the idea of original sin. Um, that um, that moment of separation, that bringing of con that bring that sort of birth of consciousness, um, was kind of it, not necessarily a mistake, but not necessarily the happiest uh, moment for humanity. Because by being conscious, we now have to we have to live with the fact that we're conscious, that we know, for example, that one day we will die, and that's kind of a heavy burden. Um, but that symbol of Adam Cadman is very potent psychologically, I think. Yeah. Um, so let me, let me unpack that symbol for you a little. Mm -hmm. So to, to use the, to use the, uh, the line of thinking that we were using before the Kabbalist as, as interpreting the biblical text mystically, mm -hmm. um, the, the first word in Genesis um, in the Hebrew is Bereshit, the first line, Bereshit bar Elohim. Uh, in the beginning, God created. Um, and the, the, the sages throughout Jewish history always pointed out something interesting, which is that one would assume that the Torah, which in the eyes of the sages is the, the perfect text, the, 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 the greatest um, sort of divine manifestation of, of, of literally the wisdom of God, uh, and therefore they expect the text to be perfect as well. Um, and which leads to a very rich hermeneutical principle that if we sense anything which seems from our human perspective to be imperfect, superfluous, redundant, uh, we can there, we can assume that that's 
incorrect and we can ask why does the text seem so and then learn something new. Uh, and this principle stands at the core of Jewish hermeneutics and interpretation for thousands of years and um, there, there will be very little Jewish literature and jurisprudence without this principle. Mm. Um, and the, 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 one of the first questions which is asked um, on the first text um, is why does the Torah begin with the letter bet, which is the second letter of the alphabet, the B, as opposed to starting with the Aleph, the A of the alphabet. It would make more sense seemingly to start with A. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are every there are many, many answers given throughout Jewish history and Jewish literature. I'm not going to go through all of them because we'll be here for a while. But the answer with the, with the which the Kabbalists particularly like is that there are two beginnings. Bet numerically is in the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph is A is one, B is two, et cetera, et cetera. So bet, say the Kabbalists, is that there are two beginnings. There's a dual narrative that's being spoken in Genesis. There's the terrestrial narrative, the historical narrative that's being laid out, um, in a, in, which is the narrative which, which people see right away and which children understand from a very young age, from the age of five. And then there's the second narrative, which is the mystical narrative, which is the mystical reading. And everything that's happening on in the normal narrative is happening simultaneously on the upper narrative mm-hmm. um and for that reason um adam eve cain abel the flood all of these anything that happens is read on a higher level too and that's a principle which is which is very fruitful and, and, and used a lot in, in jewish thought but what the Kabbalists say is that everything that's happening on this realm is happening in the sphorotic level too and they associate the 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 patriarchs and the matriarchs with different each one is associated with a different sphera. And what happens is that in the human drama of Genesis is enacting and happening and being retold and reflecting the divine, the cosmic drama of the sphera. Um, Abraham, for example, is, is chesed, is kindness, which is why Abraham is always opening his home to guests. Isaac is, is, is gvura, is, is pachat, is fear, which is because he was laid on the altar with his father holding a knife over his neck and Therefore, that makes sense as well, um, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but Adam, the Kabbalists say, is a reflection of the divine Adam, the, the primordial Adam, the primordial Adam, which is literally what Adam Kadmon. Kadmon means primordial. Kadam, kad, Kedam means like the original or the, the first, the earlier. Um, so Adam Kadmon is the primordial Adam, which is read differently in different Kabbalistic texts, but generally it's associated uh, either with the sphere of Keter, which is the highest sphere, or just preceding the sphere of Keter, it's, it's read differently in different times. But what it essentially is, it is the divine anthropos, which incorporates and encapsulates all that's going to follow after it, because it's all included in that original moment. And then the later sphere are the, are the unpackings, the unfoldings of, of that original um, encapsulated sphere. Um, and this is the same idea, this idea that the, that, Adam Harishon, the first man, is this reflection of Adam Kadmon, Kabbalistically and spherotically, is, is just part of this continual Kabbalistic narrative of these dual traditions. Um, and by, and eventually, the goal of the Kabbalist, like many other mystical traditions, is to reascend back up through the ladder of the Sfirot and also through the Olamot and parts of him, a couple of different sort of systems that, that interlock and interplay with one another, mm-hmm. to eventually re, reach back to, to God. God's self, and that happens through passing through through Keter, through Adam Kadmon, um, and therefore that's part of the the psychological um, exploration uh, and and interpretation of Genesis. Um, I also wanted to add one thing which you said before that the idea of imitating God uh, is an explicit idea in the Kabbalist because there's a biblical injuncture. Uh, the Bible says that. Um, um, the Bible says, Kadoshim tiyuki kadoshani, you shall be holy, thou shall be holy, for I am holy, says God. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the Jewish sages and uh, and interpreters of the Bible read there's a, there's an instruct there's a there's an instruction, there's a commandment, there's a biblical commandment to imitate God. Um, this is also taken up later in Christian theology. Uh, imitato die is, is a Latin Christian term, but this idea of imitating God uh, is a very, very rich idea in, in Jewish mysticism. Um, and the way that it's read is we look at the acts which God does in the Bible. Um, God, for example, um, comforts the sick. He visits um, Abraham, who we just mentioned, after Abraham is circumcised to see how he's doing. God feeds the hungry. Um, God, God buries the dead, clothes the naked. And the, the, the sages read, 
um, af hu rachum, ma, ma hu rachum af just as God is merciful, so must you be merciful. Just as God is kind, so must you be kind. Just as God is, and I think there's something interesting here, if you if you don't mind the tangent. Mm-hmm. The way I'm, I'm very fascinated by 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 a specific aspect of mysticism, which is, um, to use a fancy term, it's it's like a a puffy, a puffy elliptical mysticism, which is like the the attempt of the human to become divine, apotheosis. Um, henosis, theosis, different terms are used for it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very, I, I found something very interesting that in many traditions, the, the divinity is primarily conceptualized as either all-knowing or all-powerful. And therefore, the way which one comes to be like God is beca- either by becoming all-knowing, which is very typical of traditions like Gnosticism and Hermeticism, uh, esotericism in general, uh, occultism, or it's to be all-powerful, which you see in, in, in Roman forms of Mithraism and in other forms of mysticism. But in Judaism, the mystics focus on the omnibenevolence, the fact that God is, is all loving, all kinds. And therefore mm-hmm. to be like God is, uh, is to be not just all powerful and all knowing, those are put to the side, but to be um, omnibenevolent, to be as kind and as, as uh, to be infinitely. Um, and I, I think that's, um, I, only, I only mention that because you mentioned the, 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 the uh, desire to imitate God. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's super interesting. And I, and I start to say, I can kind of see, um, why there's why sort of mysticism, mysticism is important because it kind of it's like you said before it's kind of it's kind of not just um, thinking about the greater universe but it's also trying to figure out how should we conduct ourselves in life in life itself um, which is not always something which is uh, it's personally something I don't think about often but because I'm always interested in metaphysics and psychology but a, but a more fundamental question is like what should we do Given, like, given this strange, vast universe, how should we proceed? And I think, like, just just your explanation of mysticism and the symbols and sort of the goals of mysticism, it, it's a very like queer way. It's a very queer way how to understand what we should do as humans, what what we should strive for, like, what's the ultimate purpose? Um, which, as as we said, was sort of the reconnection with the divine. Um, and there's something else I wrote here. I, I like the what you said about that sort of the the mirror reflection um it's like something that that i've seen in uh, hermetic texts um as above so below um which is essentially as you said is like when the higher sort of the higher reflects upon the lower and the the drama of human life is in some sense also um either by metaphorical extension um or or even more literally um the, the drama of human of the family and of what we must do of, of human living is a reflection of the universe as a whole, um, and that's it's that's something that I've that I've like almost I, I thought about a lot when I think about archetypes and how they're so primordial and how they're so kind of like they kind of reflect the the very ancient past of humanity, and yet we can use archetypes to weave new meanings and greater ideas that sort of lead us to higher insights and sort of put us more towards the pa- on the path of reconnecting with God, so to speak. Um, and so I think that's really interesting. Um, I'm wondering what your your idea is, or what the Kabbalah's idea is, or what Kabbal- Kabbalistic traditions think about the sort of the purpose of humanity, of the purpose, mm-hmm. the roles of the role of humans um, in this world. Yeah, you're very right. You're 100 percent right in what you say. I, I think I think that the mystics, um, although there's sort of a the mystics get like a lot of um, bad press, and and people just generally don't know much about them mm-hmm. um so people and people assume that the mystics are very aloof and detached and um see them as sort of even, even the ones that are that are uh the even the ones that are seen as as sort of clear thinking and and one could have a conversation with which probably most people assume that one couldn't with the mystic mm-hmm. um still seem to be very you know thinking about large metaphysical issues and and huge questions of like theogony and cosmogony and who knows what um, but I think the mystics uh, actually, by and large, um, deeply cared um, and had a strong pathos for for the world and for for each other and for one another mm-hmm. um, and for for like all of sentient beings to use an Eastern term. Um, and I think I think the the ethos uh, of of I think you see this in 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 really every mysticism, at least in 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 what I think is the better strains of of each tradition. Um, but this push of, of ethics in Jewish mysticism was a very strong one. I mean, the, the, the contribution that Judaism gave to Western 
uh, society, you know, typically spoken of as ethical monotheism without entering into the semantics and academic historical mm-hmm. debates of, of that. But um, so the idea that, that there is that there's an ethical order to reality and one uh, has a ethical responsibility, thou shalt uh, live mm-hmm. in accordance with that order, is a very deeply Jewish idea. And therefore the Jewish mystics being deeply Jewish, um, their mysticism was read in line with those imperatives, with those moral imperatives. Mm-hmm. Um, there was no sort of human idea of like the, the distinction between the is and the ought and, and the no capacity to have any commanding moral presence that Kant worries about. There was real commands and there was real oughts um, mm-hmm. in Jewish ethics. Um, and the mystics, took that, the mystics took that very far. The mystics typically when spoken about in, in early texts um, are those who go beyond the letter of the law. So, so where the law requires one to um, be kind or hospitable or charitable up to a certain extent, the mystics were the ones who went far and beyond that requirement. And I, I think that flew straight from their, from their perceptions of reality. Um, and but their, their, their ethics weren't some sort of just be kind morale. They also were underpinned with a very strong metaphysical aim and trajectory and mm-hmm. it fit into the larger narrative. And I'm guessing that's what you want to hear about, which I'll tell you mm-hmm. the, to, in a very, in a very brief overview, the way that the Kabbalists understood the creation of all of reality being uh, in its totality was that uh, in a process that began with God filling the entirety of being, there was, there was nothing but God. Um, um, this language is very sort of metaphorical and theological and one needs to take time to sort of strip this language away and think differently about it. Mm-hmm. But um, just to use the language of the Kabbalists themselves, um, God fills the totality of, of being there. There's something but God and God creates a, a void, a vacuum. Tzimtzum um, is the, is the Lurianic Kabbalistic terminology for that. And God, which allows there to be a space, a conceptual space for the possibility of a creation, which in its own perspective sees itself as distinct and other than God, which allows it the possibility to, to be and be, be independent of God. Mm-hmm. Um, to, to have free will, uh, to use the mm-hmm. theological term. Um, and then God re-enters that void and, and um, inseminates and impregnates and, and begins to grow reality from mm-hmm. a point within that void. But I'm, I'm skipping over a lot here, but what happens is in that process, in the first iteration of reality, um, and this is the Kabbalists read based on early Midrashic text, which say that God built many worlds and destroyed them until he came up with our version. The Kabbalists say that in, an, in the first attempt, of reality, and I think these things are—I mean, I, these things are supposed to be understood deeply metaphorically. And uh, if they're understood literally, it's literally heresy. So don't understand them literally. But mm-hmm. in the first attempt of creation, um, the the program fails and it crashes mm-hmm. and it, it shatters, is what the Kabbalists say. Um, and in our reality, in in the world which then was created following that, which was successful because we're here today and we can talk about it, the original sparks and this is a very common theme in in, in many near eastern mysticisms the, the the original sparks of that first round of creation um fell into and and are, are shattered and glittered through and sparkled through our reality and the, the job of the mystic essentially is um to do what's called to 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 fix to to rectify to put the world back together which means mm-hmm. to to take the, the divine sparks, which have been scattered and shattered and, 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 and strewn everywhere, um, those, those, those bits of energy and light and insight and illumination and kindness, and they, they're being conceptualized in many, many ways because that's the beauty of metaphor. They can be open to conceptualizations. Mm-hmm. To, to, to reconstitute the divine pleroma, to reconstitute the, the, the divine corpus, uh, to reconstitute the mind of God, different, again, different metaphors used, back into its... A unified totality it's unification between the upper and the lower the masculine and the feminine the physical and the spiritual mm-hmm. again many conceptualizations uh, and the Kabbalists see every act um of of sanctity um and that includes both between the person and the other an act of kindness and, and um, an act of compassion and acts of devotion and worship and sanctity between between man and god uh between mankind and god as opportunities to to elevate those sparks that is the term that the Kabbalists use avoda mm-hmm. tabirim the the work the labor of of purifying of separating the 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 spiritual the light from the dross from the material 
Mm. Um, and this is very much tied into the, the, the narrative of Genesis. The Kabbalists see, because remember we have those dual traditions of the, the, uh, the two lines of Genesis, they see the story of the expulsion from the Garden of Eden as the parallel story of the shattering and the, 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 the fall in, in the divine realm. And then the attempt to re-enter Eden uh, in the Messianic age is the, the vision of the completion of this project of having um, all of the, the divine back unified. Again, it's a project of, of unity. So mm. um, that's, that's, that's in a nutshell. And I'm happy to, if you, if you have any questions of any of those points, because there's really a lot. Yeah, in that there. was, that's, that was that's the general story. Yeah, that was super interesting because I didn't know I didn't know about the, um, that that story um, of God attempting to make the world and then he needed several attempts. That's that sounds super cool to me. I never knew about that. <laughs> um, um, and and a lot of what you said, I, I feel um, it makes a lot of sense because um, that sort of idea of unity is also another psychological process because you can think of the birth of consciousness as a disunity. And this disunity occurs at multiple levels. It occurs at one level at the brain. It occurs with the, you know, your sort of expectations of society and reality. So expectations versus what's real. Um, that sort of disunity causes um, consciousness. But the, but the bringing together, the, the joining of the opposites, uh, bringing them back together is another psychological theme, um, which, is, um, which is often seen, in, for example, in the hero's myth, that idea of um, coming back together is seen in the hero's myth. Um, it's seen in a lot of myths, and it's basically the archetype of the self. And the archetype of the self is is the bringing together of opposites, the union of opposites. Um, and that union of opposites, in some sense, it, it represents a return to that sort of unconsciousness, that sort of bliss. Um, but it also is a it's also a higher consciousness because when you unify two different opposing poles, um, you sort of gain higher insights and you gain a better understanding. Um, it actually reminds me, I was talking to my friend recently um, and she wasn't going through, she's not going through a great time, but um, I could sort of see this, I, I, um, sort of what you, we were saying before, like that kind of divine spark, because, because even though she's experiencing so much adversity, she still kind of finds it in her heart to, to forgive the people who've um, sort of betrayed her and, and genuinely care about them. And I see that as sort of like, that higher consciousness because you know it's very hard to forgive people and it's very hard to to apologize for example um and so and so the again so if i that's kind of a bit of a tangent but if i go back to the sort of psychological perspective it's it's that reaching for a higher understanding um that comes from um reunifying and and it's kind of interesting that it's in kabbalah it's projected it's projected into the into cosmology as that the world is uh uh, disunited um, and needs to come back together. Um, and I wanted to, I w one question I had for you was that um, I'm not sure. So in, in Hindu philosophy, which in some Hindu philosophies, which I've read, there's the idea of non-duality, um, which is that things aren't necessarily separate from one another and that any sort of perception of uh, differentiation, for example, between me and you is just because of our egos in reality, everything is one, you know, we're all just sort of, we're all sort of part of the giant universe and the universe is just a single entity. So that's why they say non-duality. Um, but uh, how can that sort of, is, I'm, I'm wondering, does that idea appear in Kabbalah? And if so, um, in what context? Yeah. Um, so non-duality is a way typically in Eastern way, um, but also found in Western traditions um, of expressing the same idea of unity. Now, there is a subtle difference between non-duality and unity or oneness. Um, and most, the most apparent difference is that non-duality is negative. It's um, we would call in, in Christian terminology, the via negativa in Latin, uh, the path of negation. Um, and and the, reason why, the reason why it's stated in the negative and not in the affirmative um, as one, one is really the, the, the corollary of, of non-dual, of non-two is one, um, is because to affirm something about the absolute um, is seen as something which cannot be done for, for many, many reasons. Mm. Um, it's, it's seen as the, as the ineffable, both, both practically and theologically. And, and so what's done instead is, and you see this um, in Maimonides, in Pseudo-Dionysus, in Shankara, in, in Hinduism, 
instead of talking about the, the oneness of being, we'll talk about the non-duality of being. Um, in, in, in Jewish theology, this is called um, derech ashtlila, uh, the path of negation, as opposed to the derech achiv, saying things affirmatively about the divine, about the absolute, about reality. Hinduism has terminology which is also unitive and not just non-dual. For example, a uh, very famous text the, in, the, the, in um, the Upanishads, the, um, the, the, the idea is taught that the Atman is one with the Brahman, that the, that the soul, the individual, is one with, with the totality of being, with God, with the, the larger self, however you want to call it. Um, and these ideas are found, I think, throughout every mysticism. I think they're um, in Christian mysticism, in, in Sufism, in Hinduism, in Gnosticism, in Neoplatonism, and uh, across the board, and, and Jewish mysticism certainly. So Jewish mysticism um, preaches the unity of God, um, and where it goes beyond simple orthodoxy, um, it preaches the, orth- the unity of God to the exclusion of all else, which means that nothing else exists but God. Um, and if God is one, and all is God, then all is one. That's like um, pretty straight logic. Um, and this is read again from the biblical verses. The, the verse says, for example, um, there's a verse in Leviticus, I believe it is, where the verse says, uh, that, that you should know today and place upon your hearts that like God is one, there is none but God. And probably originally written, this was meant that there are no other gods but God. But when it's read by the Kabbalists, it means there is nothing at all but God. There's no being, no existence besides God. God is the only existence. Mm. Um, and therefore, whatever we encounter and experience in, in, in existence in its truest form, insofar as it truly exists, it must only be God, because God is the only thing that exists. Um, and yeah, so I think, I think in Judaism, we, 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 we have more of a unitive terminology than a, than, a, than a negative terminology. But there are times in Jewish mysticism where we'll speak explicitly in a negative term um, and we'll say... Um, for example, ein od is a is a negative term, is a is a non dualistic term. Um, n- there are none other, um, like saying there there is non dual. There's no um, polarity, um, and the yeah, and the, the idea is taught by the Kabbalists um, very very almost almost directly parallel to to the tradition of the unity of Atman and Brahman is the unity of the soul, particularly Yichida. Uh, the, the 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 quintessence of the soul with with the essence of God, um, and I think I think we I think these ideas are the fundamentals and the core of mysticism, and therefore are apparent in every tradition. Um, I'm happy also to 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 make reference to what you spoke about unity and the high unity that the returning unity. It's a, one of the core themes in Kabbalah is that when God initially creates the world, God creates the world with a direct um, shining of light. Is the metaphor that's used. It's a, it's a sort of a lateral, um, one direction, unidirectional process. Um, and whereas the, the intention is that that light should be what's called an orchazer, should be a returning light. And the idea is that it doesn't return to where it began, it returns higher to where it started, to use spatial metaphors that don't really apply in the divine. Um, and the idea is as well that, um, the, that before God created everything, there was already unity. So if the, if, the, if the objective of reality was to come to some sort of unity, that pre-existed creation and creation is pointless. But the Kabbalists and many mystics believe that there is some uh, advantage or something which is gained in the act of creation, which is almost a heretical thing to say that God gained something because that implies lack in some God. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that's discussed for a long time why that's not the theological issue, which it sounds like. Um, but the idea, the, the core idea which emerges is that that the what the unity of diversity, the unity of the of the two sides, the unity of the spiritual and physical, the masculine and feminine, is somehow a deeper, richer, more beautiful unity than the simple, undifferentiated unity that existed before. Mm-hmm. So when we when we return, it's not just a circle, but it's a spiral, and we've now returned to a higher uh, point of reality. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's all sorts of talk about that spiral going on and on, and and that circle repeating, which you find also in in, in Hinduism, and but um, that's a another conversation. Yeah, that's, that's actually that so that that really does reconcile that kind of that that sort of difference because that sort of difference between non duality and unity because 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 the way you explain is actually really interesting because it's almost like there isn't really a paradox. Um, It's just kind of a paradox because it's hard for humans to sort of conceptualize it. Um, But it does make a lot of sense, Um, especially that sort of that image of the spiral of going up towards sort of increasing unity. and interconnectedness. Uh, it's really, really interesting. Um, 
Yeah. Good to see you. I, that's, yeah, that's, I'm, I'm really glad I, I talked with you about this because I feel like I'm learning a whole lot, a lot of interesting sort of metaphysical ideas that, that I find really interesting. Um, and so I want, I, I, I can also say like why I'm so, why I'm kind of interested in uh, mysticism because um, it's kind of a, it's kind of an, an, an unorthodox approach to myth mysticism because I see mysticism um, as sort of the human mind's attempt to reach beyond itself. Um, because, you know, we're so caught up in the physical world of things right in front of us that we never really contemplate the, the big picture. And so when I think about ideas like the Einsoff, I, it's like, it's, it's very mind opening to sort of imagine the unmanifested God um, that is everything, that is beyond human perception, that is beyond human comprehension. Um, and so just that sort of, it's a very mind opening idea. Um, and this kind of brings me back, this brings me to a point between sort of the conflicts between um, sort of rational, what we call in the modern age, rational thought and mysticism. Uh, my own perspective is that um, these two, these two aren't opposites necessarily. They're presented as opposites, but it's not, it's, it's a very artificial um, dichotomy that's, that we've made. Um, I can, I can give you an example. Um, for example, somebody, uh, one idea that appears in um, alchemical texts is the idea of polarity. Um, but, um, and, and I, was, I was talking to somebody who was explaining to me why polarities aren't real. Because, for example, like there are polarities between white and dark, hot and cold. And, and they were saying to the, some, something to the extent of, well, you know, light is just the absence of dark or dark is just the absence of light. But that doesn't really contradict the idea of polarity. It's just a different way of explaining it, so to speak. And so I think that a lot of a lot of what we encounter is conflicts between sort of irrational thoughts and mysticisms, or just kind of misunderstandings. Um, I was wondering what you thought about that. Yeah, yeah. Let me. You're, you've thrown a lot to to, to to sort of think about and, and comment to. Mm -hmm. so let me. I'm gonna. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna work like yeah, in order. Yeah, please. Firstly, um, in you mentioned you mentioned twice already and i didn't respond to the idea of forgiveness as a divine attribute um it's a very interesting thing to say and i was thinking about that as you said it there is a biblical text um i believe it's um from the book of isaiah um although it may be ezekiel i'll have to check on that one where um god says to the people via the prophet um where the people are doubting the capacity for god to continually forgive them after they keep sinning and sinning and sinning. That's basically the story of, of the later books of the prophets. Mm. Um, and God says, um, mm. um, and God says, just like, um, I may have missed up the Hebrew a little, but the point is that, that the verse says that um, God says, just as heaven is higher than earth um so too are my ways higher than your ways and so too are my thoughts higher than your thoughts mm. um, and although you can't conceptualize the capacity to forgive again and again and again and again um i god can um mm. and this is seen as this is seen as an act of reassurance on behalf of god god saying that don't worry even if you can't imagine my my infinite and abundant forgiveness know that sort of my my mind is is, is infinitely greater than your finite mind um and therefore be reassured that I'm telling you, I'm forgiving you and I will forgive you, even if uh, you and your own relationships can't forgive uh, someone else that much. Um, but this text is not read by the Kabbalists later as a reassurance. It's read as a taunt and as a challenge. Um, mm. Most particularly, the text that comes to mind is from um, the great Kabbalist, um, the, the Ramak or Mershikar Devaro, who wrote a book called Tomer Devaro, the, the day tree of, of Devaro, of Deborah, where he writes that because we have this imperative to imitate God that we spoke about, um, therefore we have to imitate God's divine capacity to forgive as well. Um, mm. And and he goes at great lengths to, to talk about the, the, the great lengths that one needs to go through to, to forgive uh, again and again and again and again in a way that's superhuman. Mm. Um, and I think, I think firstly, I think, I think what you said was a very beautiful point that, that I mean, there's many. There's a long theological historical discussion is what differentiates the the, the beast, the animal, and the human. Mm -hmm. um, and this capacity for forgiveness, um, which which is uniquely and, and particularly this um, 
no, a forgiveness which isn't rational, which is not logical, which one should not do, and which, which goes beyond the, the normal societal expectations, um, is something which is, which is only the capacity of, it reaches a point where it's superhuman. And that is specifically what makes one human and what makes one different than, than, uh, than, than the beast. Mm. Uh, and what makes one divine is that, is that capacity to, to, to forgive again and again and again and again. Mm. Um, and in, in taking God's words of assurance as a challenge, uh, instead of as an assurance and, 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 and showing God, um, because we are not other than you, because we believe in the non-duality, therefore we can also forgive as a God can forgive and only a God can forgive. And in doing so, we, we prove our own divinity and humanity. Um, in regards to, um, yeah, I think I, I agree with your, your depiction of mysticism as a, as a striving for the transcendent. I think it's a very beautiful way of putting it. Mm. Um, I think I, I've, be, I've been a fan of Abraham Maslow for quite a while. He wrote a fantastic book on, on mysticism and, and religious experience. Um, and uh, he's, very, he's most known for his hierarchy of needs, uh, which was formulated differently when, when he, he published it initially and later. Um, first, it was re- first, it was published and the, the pinnacle of the triangle, the, the cap point, the capstone, Mm-hmm. was um, self-actualization. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then later on, he changed it to when he became more inclined and influenced by mysticism to by the transcendentalists and by, by the beatniks and by Zen and by who knows what, to from self-actualization to self-transcendence. Oh. Um, and, and, I think that's, and I think that change is really, it's, a, it's, a, it's, not just a, it's not just a subtle, it's not just a small change. It's a, it's a fundamental, it's a, it's a quantitative change. Because if the if the if the cap of your entire pyramid, if the if the goal of your striving, of of all of your or needs and, and directions and wills is just self fulfillment, then um, you'll be very fulfilled. But you that won't lead to lasting happiness, and it won't lead to a better and kinder world. It, it will to a degree, but when we change that paradigm and we actually take the cap off the capstone and we say it's not just about actualization it's about transcendence mm-hmm. then we've opened ourselves up to the infinite and up to the we've opened ourselves up to the other as well um because a relationship between two self-actualized beings can be a very beautiful relationship but it can also mm-hmm. be a very difficult relationship think about like two very powerful ceos or directors or whatever it is mm-hmm. trying to be together in a relationship a professional a love relationship a it, it can be, it can, you can, it can get quite messy because, you know, they're, they're each both fully self-actualized. But if, if they're, if they're striving is for self-transcendence, which is something which we're, we're always reaching and never reaching, um, that opens us up to, to the reality of the other and, and allows a real space for real interaction and inter and, and, and relation because we're no longer fundamentally separate from one another. We, there is something essentially in us that is, that is the same. Um, we both say I, and that's referring to the same I. Um, mm-hmm. as the mystics would re- refer to it. Uh, onto the third thing which you mentioned, which was mysticism and, and rationality. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the, the relationship between mysticism and rationality is a very, very fascinating one. Um, I have a good friend who actually just interviewed just before this, who um, has spent a lot of time exploring the, the, the limits of rationality within mysticism and the relationship between mysticism and the irrational. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm going to share that interview with you because I think you'll enjoy it if you're asking questions like this. Mm-hmm. Um, Gavi Kalterov, but um, I think that I think that through, I, I I've been I've been th- I, I'm interested in logic um, and in philosophy and in, in in sort of methods of thinking, and something that's possessed me for a long time um, is um, what is the is there a logical structure is there is there is there a logic of mysticism shared across uh, mystical traditions, mm-hmm. um, and I haven't come to a concrete answer. I've I've I've, I've sort of struck upon certain logical rules and axioms which i see cross-culturally east and west um from from the beginning of time until today um things like like the identity of opposites coincidentally oppositorum um the identity indifference things like um knowledge by identity as opposed to knowledge by by consumption or by um there so there are certain sort of key and i I haven't really um got into the bottom of that just yet Mm -hmm. um but just to just to sort of think out loud Rationality is also a bit of a, a bit of a term which is used to mean different things to different people. Um, rationality it usually is, I think, I think best understood as as um, as consistency of thought mm-hmm. um, of, of sort of non-internal contradiction, um, which goes back to the Aristotelian definition of, of logic 
as um, as as the as the, the law of non-contradiction is essentially the principal law of, Ar of Aristotle's logic, uh, which means that that if A is A, then A is not B, um, mm -hmm. and A cannot both be A and B at the same time. Um, right. the, the the philosophy of of logic and identity is a very very fascinating and bizarre and tumultuous one, and in recent times has been very very critically challenged by um, by 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 mathematics and by um, by set theory and by Pontier and by that's that's a whole a whole other issue. But mm -hmm. sort of to, talking about logic in a in a classical sense of of, of consistency and 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 um, non contradiction and, and using that as a stand-in for for rationality. Um, I think I think that there there were mystics who who did see themselves and did strive to be more rational. Um, um, up until a certain point, and I think uh, I think very good examples of this are people like um, Plotinus, the father of Neoplatonism. Um, I think people like like Shankara in Avadhavanta Hinduism. Um, um, just two picks from from East and West, but um, I think that at a certain point, um, the the mystic, even the most rational mystic, um, has to let go. Of, of rationality and logic and, and non contradiction mm -hmm. because the 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 core the core object um, of the mystics exploration is the absolute is the divine um, depending on how it's being framed and that thing that isness that being uh, is something which does not fit into the categories of logic and it does contradict itself inherently it's it's a it's and, and it's the, the mystics reach a space where being and non-being, where dark and light, where good and evil, um, are all are all left meaningless, um, and that's, I mean, the mystics also leave words far behind in the dust, and, and words are imperative for for, for rational thinking. Mm. Um, a point which is made very clear by by Wittgenstein. Um, so so I think the the uh, who Dante calls calls God the um, the 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 entity which is surrounded in the the garden of paradox. He like this. There's this rose bush with thorns of paradox and logical inconsistencies and it just as you enter into that thing into that space nothing makes sense anymore um and i think this is the nature of reality and and and, and people people when people hear this they're like oh my god this is like we can't talk to these people they're they're mm. they're off the wall but i think if we think about the nature of reality itself the 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 non-duality or the complementarity of of everything and nothing of being and nothingness which is essentially this paradox I think it's something which is evident in everyday life. I mean, if we go back to the Greeks, you know, the, the paradoxes of Zeno and um, and and the others. Mm -hmm. They, I'll, I'll give just two for example in modern context. We have we have it. We have a in, in philosophy of identity. There's a, there's a common problem of of who is the self, who is the I, mm -hmm. um, because the I is not necessarily continuous from one moment to the next, from one day to the next, from one month to the next. You know, mm -hmm. the cells of your body every eight years are totally replaced, and so there's not one cell left. Mm -hmm. which is a, a modern telling of the ship of Theseus. If you take one plank out of a boat and then put it on the side and then you replace with a new plank, at what point of taking those planks is now that no longer the, the, the same ship, is that no longer the ship of Theseus? And if you've mm -hmm. taken those planks that you pulled out and you've reconstructed a new bit, is, is that now a new one? So, uh, so is, there, is, there, is there a continue? So in an identity question, is there, are we the same person from one day to the next, from one month to the next, from one year to the next? Our memories change, our, our cells change, our relationships change, our, our beliefs change, our taste change so so what is the self is there any continuity uh and that's that's a very troublesome question and um and and when you encounter the other person like when you experience them you're experiencing just a fraction of their personality which is no longer continuous with the rest of them um and i think that intuitively uh we all believe and we all know this to be true um you can disagree with me if you don't think so that um that there is a logic of identity where we where we can't we cannot pinpoint and, and i'm not turning to sort of theological essentialistic language of, of soul or essence but even in our own experience we cannot pinpoint the thing that makes us us from when we were eight years old to when we were 18 years old to when we were mm -hmm. 80 years old but we know it to be true we, we we know that thing is there we know and 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 i'm not saying what that is i'm not giving it any sort of metaphysical language but there is some point of continuity Mm -hmm. um, and likewise, when you when you when you encounter someone for the first time and you make it, they make a first impression, that same first impression will be at, will be an experience of, of of you know nothing about them, but you know everything about them simultaneously. And that and you can know them for fifty years from now, 
and still that first impression will be in them in every single moment and instantiation of their being as it comes. So this relationship, uh, this, this very paradoxical relationship, which makes no sense of the, the, the absolute um, cohabitation, the, the living togetherness of, of the, the total nothing, because there's nothing about you when you're eight and when you're 18, that's the same. And there's nothing about the, the person who you went on a date with and you had a first impression, it's the same 20 years later. And yet everything's the same. Between, between those people to use, mm-hmm. a, to use identity as, as, a, as a, and, and this can be applied in many, many fields, um, in mathematics, in, in, in physics, in, um, in biology, this, this the, the, the identity of the absolute difference of everything and nothing. Um, and so, so it, it may not seem, it may not seem logical or comprehensible, um, but um, I think it's, uh, I think it's undeniable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, that that's that's really a great way to put it. Um, and I, I was I there's something you said that I wanted to ask about, which is something you said um, regarding sort of the the relationship between God and man. That God is kind of um, kind of challenging man. Um, what I didn't. What was the sort of nature of that kind of challenging relationship? Hmm. Um, in. In, uh, in when God was t- was talking about uh, his capacity for forgiveness, mm-hmm. you're saying, um, yeah, I think I, there's there's something very in 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 the in the Tanakh in the Hebrew Bible. There's a very fascinating relationship between God and humanity, mm-hmm. um, and between God and Jewish people particularly. Um, the and the relationship is one um, of 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 love of betrayal of desire, of anguish, of regret, mm. of hope, of anticipation. Um, and in that relationship, uh, it's, 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 almost a very, it's almost a very human relationship between two lovers. I and mean, sometimes it's between a father and a son, and sometimes it's between, um, between a king and a subject, and, and it's, the relationship changes. Sometimes it's a, it's a shepherd and a, and a, and a, and a sheep. Um, but something that you see quite consistently in the relationship in the Bible between God and mankind is that they're constantly um, testing and trying and challenging one another. Um, Abraham goes through 10 tests uh, until God finds him worthy. Uh, the final test being the sacrifice of Isaac. Mm-hmm. Um, when God wants to destroy um, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham tests him and says, has um, color arts like us, but will, will, will the judge of well, the justice of, of all of the universe not do justice um and when 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 god wants moses to take the people out of out of egypt um god challenges him and 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 he refuses and he finally forces him to go and then when then finally Mo, later moses when moses does go to egypt he says and things get worse he says uh lama haraisa lama why have you made it worse for the people i mean it's this relationship where there's they have no qual they have no issue um, neither God to the people nor the people to God of telling each other how they think and uh, challenging them and, and, and reprimanding them and, 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 and putting them on the spot. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's constant throughout the relationship. And, and I think that uh, it may look like a very dysfunctional relationship. Um, it may look like a very, a very chaotic and a very strange relationship mm-hmm. uh, where, there's, where there's sort of moments of, and even in the same, in the, even in the very same moment, for example, when the Jews leave Egypt in, in the book of Exodus, um, on the, in, in, in some biblical texts, I'm looking back at this earlier biblical period, for example, in the book of Hosea, uh, in, in, the, in the book of the Song of Solomon, um, this moment of leaving Egypt is seen as an ultimate moment of, of bliss and young love and, and this, this, like this doe that is coming up on the mountainsides, leaning on her lover is, is how it's described later. Um, following God into an unknown land. And in the very same episode read, read by other biblical texts, it was a moment where the Jews were being totally um, disobedient, and totally of little faith, and totally, uh, they, they, and you read the biblical text itself, they want to go back to Egypt, how come there's no food in the desert, let us mm-hmm. go back there and die, why do you bring us here to die? Um, so there's this very, there's this very multi-layered, very complex, like any relationship, that's what happens in any, in any relationship, and I think that, um, I think that, I think that true relationships um, aren't idyllic, and they're not Hollywood, and they're not happily ever after, and they're not, um, true relationships are where the partners feel free to communicate and challenge and speak up and tell each other how they feel and tell each other when they feel like the other partner's done something wrong and also to 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 challenge the partner to grow and to hope that they do better and 
you know, there's this, there's this debate sort of in, in relationship philosophy of whether we accept people as they are and, and, um, and we don't try to change them because mm-hmm. we love them as they are, uh, whether we want to see them improve and, and whether because we love them, we want them to be better uh, mm-hmm. and to fulfill their potential. Um, and there's definitely truth to both of those. Um, and I think, I think in the, in, in the biblical relationship, you see, you, you see both of those being carried out where there's an intrinsic inalienable love that doesn't depend upon the, the failures of successes of either party. And yet mm-hmm. there's a real desire to, to challenge and push. Um, I hope, I hope I'm answering somewhat in the direction of what you were hoping yeah. to, to hear. Yeah, that's, that's actually, that, that, that answers it really well. Cause I, I, that, in, that relationship sort of between God and man, um, the, the nature of the relationship that it's not always necessarily a trusting relationship. Um, that's something that that's brought up in the, the book of Job, which is, um, which is the, a book that that Jung went into great detail about in a big essay, a very famous essay, where he argued that um, the Satan or Satan in that book is a sort of shadow of God, is sort of the dark side of God um, projected into mankind, uh, projected or projected um, into the world. Um, and sort of the relationship between God and uh, Job in that story is, is, it sounds very similar to what you were describing in that and that in some sense, Job doesn't understand why, because he, he, throughout the book, he's inflected with all these terrible uh, things uh, from the devil. And he doesn't understand why is this happening to me? Why, did, why is God allowing this? And God's answer to him is essentially, like, you're, is in some sense, is you're just not in a position to understand my purpose, like what I really represent. You know, you're, you're, you're like, he doesn't, I mean, he says, kind of says it in a de- denigrating way, but it's also kind of true that just humans aren't at that level to understand the true nature of the divine, but we can get there. We can, by building our knowledge, by, by um, sort of striving towards self-transcendence, as you put it, we can reach that relationship and that true understanding of the nature of God and sort of understand why we're here and what our purpose is and, and why God created us, so to speak, why do we, why we exist. Um, but that it, we can't expect the answers to those questions to just sort of be given to us on a platter because humans, we, we aren't built to, to understand these complicated things. You know, we're, we're fundamentally natural beings. Um, but through sort of this process of becoming um, more intelligent and becoming striving towards consciousness, we've been sort of been able to peer into the sort of greater workings of the universe. Uh, both within mysticism and also just within our studies of physics. We now understand the universe to such a degree. And that's just so amazing to me that like this, basically this, what we, what we were once were has now been transcended. We're, humans are so much more than what we used to be. And that process keeps going and going. And, you know, it's, it's like um, apotheosis, as you said. Um, now, there's something I wanted to get your opinion about, which is um, some, something of a debate in psychology, especially in Jungian psychology, is to whether consciousness and so I sort of see consciousness as a reflection of the divine. Like our 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 consciousness is something higher than than sort of the unconscious instinctual human. Um, but again, consciousness comes at this cost of it's very similar to the cost that uh, we see in the Genesis story, um, where eating the apple causes one to leave the the, the garden of paradise. Um, and so I, want, I was wondering what you thought. Was, is consciousness uh, a necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, or is it more complicated than that? Hmm. Um, is consciousness a good thing or a bad thing? Let me, let me first uh, answer to, uh, to the answer to Job. Mm-hmm. So Jung's book, The Answer to Job, uh, which is a very, a very, very fascinating heretical subversive gnostic reading of of, of the biblical book mm-hmm. um the, w- the way i understood the book was a bit different and this might actually lead us this might actually answer both questions um jung sees god um in the book um as as almost being too um pure and removed and abstract from reality that mm. god doesn't truly really understand job and got and job's suffering um mm. and and jung opens up a whole new layer to the book which is just just genius where whereas the the book has been read for for thousands of years as as god testing job and job not understanding god mm. um and then god coming in the big well and saying you know i created the behemoth i created the leviathan i laid out the heavens and earth like mm. where were you when that happens mm. um jung flips the story and he says that that 
it's the suffering of Job that Jung, that that God doesn't understand. That God, being high and mighty up in heaven, um, doesn't know what it's like to be down here in reality. Doesn't know what it's like to feel pain and feel love and feel blessed and feel mm. anguish, and feel loss, um, and that God, in some way, is 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 jealous of Job, who represents the human, the human's knowledge of what real uh, manifestation uh, and real lived experience is, um, and this, this, I mean, this is my reading of the book, and it could be wrong, and it's been a while since I read the book, but but I but it struck me that that the the, the genius of Jung was that. Um, Jung is creating a, a paradigm to question the very act of creation itself. So the very act of creation is God leaving the unconscious realm mm -hmm. to come into manifest consciousness, which is the transition from God to man, God to Job. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially the act of creating Job, the act of testing Job on the cosmic narrative, like we right on the upper, on the upper narrative mm -hmm. is is in other words, the act of God coming into manifestation to experience pain himself, mm -hmm. right? This is, this might be, this might be, uh, this might be, tell me if this is a bit much, but what, 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 what's happening here is that we, we've been speaking this whole time about, we've been using two very different theological uh, notions. We've been talking about God is other and separate from the human. Um, and then God is non-dual and one with the human. So the, mm -hmm. the orthodox and mystical, let's call it. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what Jung does is Jung, uh, takes those and he and he twists them in a beautiful way so we have this discussion between god and job because it's, it has to be non-dual it's a discussion between god and god it's it's, it's a discussion between god is unmanifest and god is manifest mm. god is god is as above uh suffering and birth and death and life and love and everything and god as 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 us as experiencing all those things as god is now because mm. creation happened and and job god in creation is questioning himself the the pre-creation god why did you do this do you do, do you really think this was a good idea to create creation do you really think that all of this suffering was worth it um do you think which is your question do you think consciousness is good do you really does this look like a good move to you god look how look how messed up humanity is they're, they're killing one another they're they're starving to death there's 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 sort of indescribable and infinite pain. Um, and this is the craziest part of, of Jung's reading. When, when God comes to Jung and says, sorry, when God comes to Job and says, where were you when I laid the heavens and earth? Where were you? God saying to God, you don't know what it was like to be me pre-creation. You don't know how, how empty and how lonely and how, and how, and how sad that, that existence, that reality was. Um, and Whereas it's typically read as God showing his superior knowledge and wisdom in Jung's reading, it's God coming and, and saying, I'm sorry to, to Job saying, you're right. This was a mistake. I should not have, I should not have put you into the suffering. I should not have afflicted you with the boils of, I shouldn't have made creation. I shouldn't have brought you into being, into existence. I shouldn't have done this to myself. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and he, he, he kind of covers behind this veil of, of omniscience and be like, oh, you don't know, you didn't see, you weren't there. But really between the lines, he's saying, he's saying, yeah, I, 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 I messed up. And then after that, after that, the end of the book, which most people don't even realize, um, and I, I need to reread Jung's book because I don't know if this is my own imagination um, or if this is what Jung says, but when the story ends, with with job being re-blessed with with double the children and and, and re-blessed with his wealth and with his family and with his life and with his wife again and then it comes to to praise god and thank god it's it's a moment which which is god as created god as manifest turning back to himself to the unmanifest god to the, to the unconscious and saying you know what actually um maybe because i'm able now to experience love and and union and 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 children and family and friends maybe maybe that suffering was worth it and maybe maybe you're right after all and maybe um maybe it was a good thing maybe consciousness maybe consciousness is good after all um it's just it's a, it's a tremendous it's a trim it's it's just a wow one one can one can get lost for, for yeah. years on, on that it, idea that was a really way, beautiful way to put it
Um, I, I really like the idea, especially of God having a conversation with himself, because um, that's kind of what that's that's kind of what is happening in a sense. Um, okay, so I think um, I, I'm. I that was a really great conversation. Um, I was really I really learned a lot. I feel almost like enlightened <laughs> from what I've learned. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, Debbie, for talking to me and uh, yeah, and answering these questions about these really interesting topics. So that was my conversation with Zev, aka Seekers of Unity. Like, like I said before, he has an amazing YouTube channel, which I think you should definitely check out. It discusses um, a lot of the things we discussed right now, and he goes into a lot of detail about uh, metaphysics and mysticism, um, as well as other topics in philosophy. Um, so if that's up your alley, and I think you should, we did, definitely should check it out, uh, check the description for, his, um, for the link to his channel. Um, and thanks for watching. Take care.